We are going to open up our Bibles to Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. And I got to tell you, I'm excited to be here. I'm just ready to dig into God's Word. I thank God that the sun is out. I think that the wind is down. Um, it's good to be in Hammett right now. And so let's enjoy it while it lasts. And you know what? Let's, let's get out there and invite our friends and neighbors uh, out to, to God's house and hear His Word. And uh, the title of this message is called The Tragedy of Rejecting God's Love. You know, if you've ever loved someone so much, you have given them your love. You've gone the extra mile for them. And then in return, they reject you. That hurts. Your heart hurts. I don't care how tough you are or how savvy you might be in a relationship. It hurts. Because you have been giving of yourself. And you give and you're investing and you're giving. And you should expect a return in that because that's what true love is, right? A relationship between two people giving to one another. For three and a half years, Jesus Christ has been giving of his love, offering forgiveness to all people, especially the teachers of his day, especially to the religious leaders. And what, what did they choose to do for these three and a half years? For the most part, these guys had st stuck up their nose to Jesus. They chose to be enthralled with their self-made resentment towards Jesus because he had threatened their manipulating power over the people. And in so far in this chapter, in chapter 21, we've been in it for a few weeks now, Jesus had just the day before gutted out the temple. He had gutted it out of the financial and spiritual perversion that had infiltrated the temple by the chief priests and the elders. You see, the financial corruption had just gotten so bad, it had become so much a priority for the leading religious leaders that it, they deprived the people from sound doctrine. And when you deprive somebody from sound doctrine, it is like depriving somebody of their own blood. So after purging the filth of the temple, Jesus goes back the very next day. He walks into the temple. This time he doesn't walk in to condemn the people or what was going on, but he comes back to revive the famished hearts of the people. Jesus, just like the good physician, after surgery, what does a good physician, a good country physician do? He pulls out his bottle, his bottle of medicine, and his spoon, and he hand feeds his patients. And here Jesus is hand feeding the word of God to the people. It is a beautiful picture of what the Lord does for us. Sometimes he cuts us out, he guts us out, right? But in his loving grace, he doesn't take off on us. He returns to us, and then he fills us with his loving word. In the middle of his teaching, we've seen that the religious elite came up to him while he's teaching there in the courtyard of the temple in Jerusalem. And the religious elite come up to him, they, they, they disrupt him, they, they trot in and they start questioning him. And what's that big question that we saw last week? By what authority do you do these things? By what authority do you heal the people? By what authority do you raise the dead to life? By what authority do you make broken marriages mended again? By what authority do you offer salvation? And Jesus having already explained his authority many times before, turns the table on these guys, these super intellectuals of the day, puts them on trial, and shines the light on their disobedience through a parable. You may recall that parable. It was the parable of the repentant son and his rebellious brother. I want to give you a quick recap of that. The repentant son had originally rejected his father's request to go and tend the vineyard. He had told us that, I don't want to go. I don't want to go and, and, and help out. I want to reject you, your, your offer to me to go work. But sometime as he was walking away, he got convicted. He came to his senses. 
And he determined in himself to obey his father. And he went and he tended to the, to the vineyard. The second son was offered the same by the father, to go and tend to the vineyard. And this second son was a big fat liar. How do we know that? Because he said, oh yeah, dad, I'm going to go. But he didn't go. The second son is the picture of a hypocrite. A guy that knows how to give lip service, and he only does it for his own interest. At the end of the day, he's lazy. His lifestyle is only about me, myself, and I. And now, you would think at this point that the religious leaders would have gotten the point. They they would have said, Lord, man, I need to be like that first son. I need to be like that one that comes to his senses, gets convicted by your word, and goes about your business. But we're going to see that that didn't happen. So now what Jesus is going to do, he's going to go give them a second parable. And this parable gets in their face. This parable is confrontational. This parable is like a spotlight on the eyes of, of a deer in the middle of the road. And we're going to read it. Verse 33. Hear another parable. There was a certain land owner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now, when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruits. And the vine dressers took his servants, and this is what happened. They beat one, they killed one, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then, last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. Wow. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. As we dissect this passage, there's a lot going on here. And I'm going to try to speed it up a little bit. In high school, I remember that our English teacher would give us like a 500-page book, and I just totally did not like reading. And so uh, we learned really quick something called the cliff notes. You guys heard about cliff notes? So we would race to the bookstore. So I'm going to give you some cliff notes, okay? So if you're taking up notes, here we go. The landowner in this passage, in this parable, remember a parable is a story with a lesson. The landowner is God. The vineyard is the people. The vine growers, in this case, are the religious leaders. And next, the servants are the messengers or the prophets. See, the prophets in the Old Testament, they were messengers of God. And lastly, the son is Jesus himself. Jesus opens up this parable with some very profound words. And sometimes we can overlook our reading because some of us just kind of like to skim read. But here, let us dive into this. Jesus says this, hear another parable. This word for hear means this, don't be deaf. Pay attention. Listen up. Perceive so that you can have understanding. Jesus is telling these guys, get your cotton swabs out of your ears. I have something really serious to tell you. And if this was just any old conversation, I'm sure we would see that Jesus would have been less confrontational. But Jesus has over and over and over again has tried to reach out to these intellectuals. You see, these second and third chances, these fourth chances, these fifth chances, these sixth chances have been showing Jesus' grace even upon these religious intellects. But now Jesus is saying, look, there comes a point where you choose to reject me. And so listen up. This is your last and final warning. In so many words, that's what Jesus is saying. And God is so good like that even with us, isn't he? 
He'll give us a second chance, a third chance. Hey, don't do that. You know that's wrong. God, the Holy Spirit is talking to you. You guys are having this conversation go down. And then the other part of you, the flesh, is, is, is having another conversation and rationalizing everything out. And then God in his grace, he lets you go by, gives you the grace card, and then you keep on pulling that grace card, and God says, hey, you can't abuse my grace. Read Romans chapter 5 about that. So, it's now time that Jesus is bringing down the hammer, and now this parable is in their face. In verse 33, we note this, the landowners work and the landowners care. You see, the landowner had invested of his own resources to buy the land. It was the landowner who gave of his hard work, his hands, his resources to plant the vineyard. It was also the landowner who did something pretty, pretty remarkable. He would then construct a wall around his entire vineyard. Could you imagine how much money that would cost? How much sweat that would cost? I got a, a quick... Uh, a sample or example for you of a vineyard that has a wall, a, a wall all around it. And it looks something like this. The vineyard's hedge of protection. You can see the wall that just, I mean, on my computer, it just goes on and on and on and on. You see, it was all the work of the landowner. Salvation is only a work of God. There is only one man, one God-man that could do the work of salvation, and his name is Jesus Christ. When I see the vineyard, its hedge of protection, it reminds me that you and I are indestructible until God takes away that hedge of protection. Know this, no matter what you're going through, God has a hedge of protection and he knows when it's time to take away that hedge of protection. That's why he says that no temptation will befall you that you cannot handle. But when you can't handle it, guess what? There's a hedge of protection. Satan himself even knows this. Did you know that? You see, Job, he had been blessed by the Lord. And God had told Satan one day, have you considered Job? He's a righteous man, blameless in my eyes. And Satan and, and God have this, this conversation in Job chapter 1, verse 10. And this is how it goes. Have you not made a hedge around him? This is Satan telling God. Around his household, around all that he has on every side. Let me pause there. God has a hedge of protection all around you. God has your back. I don't care what's happening at work when all these things are going down with the gossip and, oh, what's going to happen, what's going to happen, what's going to happen, people talking behind your back. God has a hedge of protection around you. Allow him to be that brick wall around you instead of your thoughts. And so the conversation goes on. You have blessed the work of his hands as the Lord has this hedge of protection around you Know this, he will bless the work of your hands. It may not happen overnight. We're in a microwave society, you know, 60 seconds or less. But he will bless the work of your hands. And his possessions have increased in the land. So Satan is kind of like this crybaby. And he knows and recognizes this hedge of protection around, if you would, the vineyard of Job. The landowner, we know also here in verses 33 and 34 that the landowner did not leave the vineyard without sustainability. We see that he also dug in a wine press. What is a wine press? I'll show you a picture of it. At the very top here, what they would do is they would put the grapes up there and they would squash them. And then they would have like a little canal, if you would, going through these different pools allowing it to go through different stages of fermentation. Then what would happen is the landowners and the vine dressers, they had an agreement. Hey, we're going to sell X amount. You get your portion, I get my portion. There was always sustainability. What does this tell me? That God 
always will take care of us because it's a work about him and not us. All we got to simply do is be like the grapes. Hang in there. We also note here in verse 33, a tower. I love this picture. Can I show you? You see that tower right there? It's overlooking this vast vineyard. What was the tower for? The tower was to watch for thieves. The tower was also used to store resources for those rainy days. It is just like the Lord to always has his eyes on you, to take care of you, to take care of your family, to take care of your actual circumstance. And for those rainy days, it's okay because he got it all covered. His tower of strength is there always, and it cannot be removed. I love Psalm 145, 20. It says, the Lord watches over all who love him. You get this picture that God is just there on the tower looking at all that the enemy wants to do. And because he's seated up on his throne, he can see everything. That's why we, all we got to do is look to the tower. All we got to do is look at him s- sitting there saying, oh, I know what we're going to do. Nothing will sideline God. Because he is on his throne. You see, this tower is also a place of shelter. Psalm 61 verse 3 tells us this. A shelter for me. It's individual for you. A strong tower from the enemy. You know, you might have to put somebody's name as your enemy tonight. Or some company. Or whatever it might be. Just know that God is your strong tower. Allow God to be that strong tower. So from the planting of the vines to the whole operation and the protection of the vineyard, the entire work of this program, if you would, is a work of the landowner. No one can really take credit for it. You see, the grapes, they were once seeds, weren't they? They needed to be planted. By who? The landowner. The vine dressers were simply harvesting. You could say that they were freeloading. The servants were simply sending messages on behalf of the landowner. And this parable starts off reminding us that all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, all the majesty is placed in the work and in the name of the landowner who so happens to be God. Salvation is his work. That is why Ephesians chapter 2, many of you have it memorized. For by grace, that which you do not deserve, but he gives it to you anyways. We have been saved through faith. The only thing that is our part, if you would, is that we receive it or we reject it, like these religious leaders did. And it's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. I love Christmas. And when I get gifts, I like it. But sometimes I get some gifts that are like, wow, I don't even deserve this. Now, could you imagine me getting this wonderful $1,000 gift card to In-N-Out Burger? And I look at it, and I know I don't deserve it. Perhaps I was a bad boy that week, or I argued with my wife or something, and my wife comes with that $1,000 gift card to in and out Now, first of all, since I'm married to her, I'll probably say, can we get a refund? But in all reality, in all reality, because I know I don't deserve it, the only thing I can do is just one of two things. Receive it, take you guys out to lunch, Right? Everybody said amen, right? Amen. Or reject it and throw it in the trash can. That is kind of like what I'm talking about, what God is talking about regarding salvation. You see, our salvation is not determined on how abundant our talents are. Our salvation is not dependent on how cool we can speak or the influence we have on others or the VP position we might have. 
Salvation is dependent on God himself. Because if it had anything to do with you and me, we would say, hey, look how cool I am. You know, it's because I got really good shoes. Or it's because God needed me. Or it's because X, Y, and Z. And you know what God has to say about that? If anybody ever even thinks that salvation is based on their way of gaining salvation, Galatians chapter 6, verse C says this, if anyone thinks he is something, he's a nothing. Wow! Man, just floor me on that one. Why? Because he deceives himself. How about 1 Corinthians 4, 7? My dad tells this to me all the time. What do you have that God has not given you? It's my dad's way of keeping me low. What do you have in your garage? What do you have in your living room? What do you have in your room that has not been given to you by God? I'm going to explain it to you in a different way. Do you you know that God could have placed the soul that is inhabiting this body right now in a soul in some person in Africa starving? Who determined that? Did you? God determined that. It is all a gift of God. Salvation is a gift of God. That's why when you understand this, you want to fall in love with God. You you want to just tell him, Lord, here's my life. Use it. And here's the deal. The grapes are there hanging in there. Their job is to abide in the vine, just like we sang about earlier. The the landlord, God plants us. It is the landlord that waters us. It is the landlord that protects us. It's the landlord that sustains us. And the vine dressers, their role is simply to tend to the vineyard and help develop it out. In this case, the religious leaders, the vine dressers, really didn't do their job. Verses 34 through 36, we note this the fate of God's messengers. We see here is that they didn't live up up to their their side of the bargain, if you would. The vine dressers were supposed to have done a job, get a portion, and give another portion over to the landowner. But they didn't do that. So what does the landowner do? What does God do? He sends messengers to tell them, hey, we just want to come on behalf of God. And uh, we want to see the fruit. Now, what do they do? The first set of servants, and Mark tells us in Mark chapter 11, that three servants came. They came in different times. Matthew puts them all together. One servant, the first, he went there as a messenger. Have you ever heard of the, the, um, the saying, hey, don't, don't shoot the messenger? <laughs> you know, don't fire me. I'm just delivering a message. And this messenger comes and delivers this message, and he gets beat up. Then the second one comes, meaning that the landowner knew about the first one getting beat up, so he sends a second one, and what do they do? They kill him. And then, knowing this, what does the landowner do? He sends another servant, another messenger. And what happens? They stone him probably with the same rocks that the landowner used to build his vineyard. Now, at this point, you would think that these wine dressers would have been, oh my gosh, repentful. But what happens? Do they ask for forgiveness? No. They don't. And we read here in the text that the landowner sends even more servants than the first time. In nowhere as we're reading here do we see the landowner getting upset. Could you believe that? Nowhere do we see God bursting in anger. But in his loving grace, he continues to send his message to the people to get right, to do the right thing. What happens here? We see that they go ahead and will will kill the other servants. 
Jesus on one occasion told these religious leaders, this sorrow awaited them. It's in Luke chapter 11, verse 47. He told them, for you build monuments for the prophets. You build monuments for the prophets your own ancestors killed long ago. And you see, their whole lineage was filled with religious men that murdered God's own people. Tradition has it that Isaiah in the Old Testament was sawed in half. And he's alluded to in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 37. You could read it at home. Jeremiah, the great prophet, the weeping prophet, he was stoned to death. Zechariah, a messenger of the Lord, a servant of the Lord, was murdered inside the temple. Could you imagine me preaching right here and some guy saying, boom, you know, get out of here. What do we see here? Zechariah, he was murdered inside the church simply for delivering a message of God to the people. What was that message? It's in 2 Chronicles. I want to read it to you. Then the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, who stood above the people. And he said to them, Thus says God, Why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord. He has also forsaken you. So they conspired against him, against Zechariah, and at the command of the king, they stoned him with stones in the court of the house of God. Wow. For the Christian, there is additional application for us here. God desires to also see fruit in us. What are some of the fruits of the Spirit? Galatians 5 tells us this. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. In His loving grace, the Lord does not hit us over the head when our fruit seems little. But this is a great story for us too. It's a great application for us to recheck how much fruit is coming out of us? Are we limiting our love for one another? Have we seen our joy run dry and replaced it with happiness? Is there a confusion in your home? The Bible says that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Are you long-suffering even when people mess up on you? Do you show kindness when people don't deserve it? Are you being good? Are you being faithful? Are you being faithful with your eyes? Are you being faithful with your thoughts? Are you gentle towards others, especially when they don't deserve it? I have a close family member that every time I'm trying to be gentle with this person, they just kind of get worked up and we wind up kind of just at odds. But God is reminding me that I need to grow in my gentleness towards Him. Am I growing and showing fruit of self-control? Or am I impulsive in my decision-making and just doing it? What we see here is that the Lord is asking and requiring the landowner to see some fruit. And sadly, the teachers of the day did not develop the people out to show this type of fruit. And so what happens after this long suffering? The landowner goes to where no parent will never, ever want to go. And that is to risk the life of their only son. If someone were to ask me, Andy, in order to save that convict over there, I need for your son to be put on the electric chair. What parent would do that? No parent would do that. But here the landowner risks the life of his only son out of love for these murderers. And in verse 37 he says this, Then last of all, he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. This word for respect can also be translated 
that they would be ashamed to even dare to even think to do any harm to my only son. And that son is Jesus Christ. And in verse 38 and verse 39, when the vine dressers saw the son coming, they said, that's the heir. Come, let us kill him. Let us seize him. Let us get his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard, and they killed him. Obviously, these guys were not good babysitters of the vineyard. These vine dressers profess to be something that they were not. And there are so many that profess Jesus, but they don't profess him and live him out, live out that he is Lord. And in verse 40, we read this, and I know we're short on time. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, that what will he do to the vine dressers? So here's a question that Jesus is giving to these really smart guys. And this is the same question people ask about the judgment of those who reject Jesus. And they respond correctly. And they said, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. They were basically self-incriminating themselves. And in verse 41, we note this, the consequences of rejection. The consequences of rejecting God's love is quite simple, and it's hell. It's eternal separation from God. Hell is not a popular subject in church. Hell is not a popular subject in evangelizing according to some people. In fact, many people shy away from even mentioning hell because they feel it's too harsh. It's going to hurt their feelings. And you've got to ask yourself this question. Are you willing to tell the truth and save someone from hell? Or are you the type of person who wants to be nice and let them suffer in hell? This word for destroy here means to entirely abolish, put an end to ruin. This is relating to eternal death. The religious leaders are telling Jesus, It's quite obvious. Send those guys to hell. In fact, this word for destroy is also found in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, just like here with the landowner giving his only son, that whosoever believes, meaning even these murderers, if they would have believed in Jesus, should not perish. They would not be destroyed. That means that they would not be destroyed in hell forever but have instead everlasting life. In verse 42, Jesus told them, have you never read the scriptures? In other words, have you never opened your Bibles even when you went through seminary? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. In verse 42, we note this, all Scripture points to Jesus. All Scripture points to Jesus. Jesus right here is quoting from Psalm 118, the very psalm that was sung when he walked on into Jerusalem. And the question is, who is the chief cornerstone? It's the Word of God, and the Word of God is Jesus. And here the Word had become flesh, and it was so marvelous to see the Word of God now dwelling amongst men. They should have marveled that God became man in order to die for their sin. When the temple was under construction, the stones that were quarried, they were some 40 feet wide and 20 feet high. And when they would place them on top of each other, you could not even get a blade through them. And tradition has it that one day, as they were putting down the foundation of the temple, they thought they had an extra stone. And so the builders, you know what they did? They threw it off the cliff there at the Kidron Valley. Later on, when the next crew came, they were looking for that stone. And it so happened that that stone that was tossed over the cliff was the chief corner stone. When you reject the chief corner stone, 
your foundation will always collapse. You see, when the emotion, t- emotional tides come in life, you're going to be depressed and you're going to run to, to the doctor for pills. But when the chief cornerstone is Jesus Christ, you will not be moved because you stand firm on Him and not your emotions. Is there an amen in the house? So in verse 43, Jesus tells them, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Verse 44, And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. The chief cornerstone is our rock, a rock that we can stand firm on. It's immovable. You see, by having the chief cornerstone, no hurricane, no, no tornado, no issues in this life, no matter how hard they might be, will not move your core being. It reminds me of this chief cornerstone in this watchtower. You see that the ocean is banging against it. But I can only imagine that inside, the watch looker is there having coffee, watching cable TV. Why? Because that tower is on the chief cornerstone. To the Jew, it's a stumbling block, Romans 9.32. To the Gentiles, Jesus is a smiting stone, Daniel chapter 2. For us believers, Jesus is our foundation, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. For all men who have decided to stand on this, you can stand on your this, that on your last breath, this foundation that you stand on will be your foundation for eternity, and you'll be immovable. In verse 45 and 46, as we end, the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, and they finally understood. They perceived that he was speaking of them. Let me stop there. When the Lord is speaking to you in a message, whether it's on a Wednesday night or Sunday night or on K-Wave, know this, that you have a choice to take heed, to perceive that that's for you and respond or to reject God's word for you. In verse 46, but when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. After being so kind, the landowner gives the vine dressers Their own choice, and that's eternal condemnation. God did not come into the world to condemn it, but rather he came into the world that it might be saved through him. We have that painted in our foyer. God does not desire anybody to be condemned. Nobody. But those who reject this free gift, they are saying, God, I want you to condemn me. And Jesus explains this in John chapter 3. I'll read it quickly. He says, and this is the reason why people get condemned. This is Jesus talking. This is not me or anybody else. That the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil uh, hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. There comes a point where people say, look, I want to stay in this darkness. Leave me here. But if that is you, I would like to give you one last opportunity. And this opportunity is for you to say, look, I want to put that darkness behind me and I want to live in the light. Yes, it might hurt my eyes for a bit. Yes, I have to get rid of certain things in my life. But I know it's for my good. I want to have eternal life. And if you simply confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and not only have that lip service, but that you have it and you believe it in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. And not only will you be saved, but guess what? If you truly receive this, you will have the right, the inheritance of becoming a child of God. And it's only reserved for those who believe. Would you simply believe? And to the Christian, remember this. Do not let the enemy 
try to sow doubt of your salvation. You are a child of God. That is your right, and nobody can take it away. If God himself will not take it away, read Romans chapter 8. If he will not condemn you, then who will? God's salvation for us is a work of the great landowner. And he loves you. He is slow to anger. And he simply wants you to believe and do the right thing.